I want to start today by thanking Ann Buckner for inviting Henry to do these lectures. It's, it's been a really wonderful experience for both of us, and uh, without Ann, there would be no lectures. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Ann. Now, Margo assured me that you all know who Henry is. In other words, I don't have to make a speech, but I will do a land acknowledgement while people are still coming in. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish people who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin throughout the San Juan Islands and the North Cascade watershed from time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Duwamish, Suquamish, Nisqually, Snoqualmie, and Muckleshoot tribes for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. Okay, Henry, you're on. Well, I'm going to begin by um, just mentioning a few African-American architects uh, who tend to get left out of the story. And the first one I'll mention is Benjamin McAdoo, uh, who is actually represented by an exhibition at the University of Washington in Gould Hall, the, where the School of Architecture uh, operates. And um, he was a... He, he was educated at the University of Washington uh, early in the century and had a very successful career, partly in Seattle. So he was the first African-American to practice architecture in the state of Washington. And at first he worked, worked for an agency on international development in Washington, D.C., and he set up uh, the Latin American division of AID. So here was uh, a young man, barely out of school, uh, who was g obviously recognized as having great potential for organizing important things. And I'll just show you a little bit of, of his work, but if you happen to be over at the university, you'll find uh, this show in Gould Hall, uh, where you can see a bit of it in the distance uh, here. And obviously, I'm not able to go into very much detail on him. His house is an absolute masterpiece. A beautiful thing. And, and it's still there, is it? Yes, I think so. Do you, well, do you know where it is? No. In, in, so I only know it from photos. Yes. Well, I do have uh, a black and white photo of some details of it. He designed the Queen Anne swimming pool uh, on, on the hill. And this is a view of its interior. And here's a very uh, original uh, version of, uh, of a sort of modernist Northwest. It sort of combines um, ideas that were forming in the Northwest in architecture uh, and more standard modernism. Uh, I do not know where this house is, but it has a sort of exuberance uh, that I think is commendable. Oh, I did have a picture of his house, but it, but it got lost. I also wanted to mention Norma Skalarek, uh, who had an incredible career uh, as an architect, she lived from uh, 19, uh, 20, uh, 1926. The, so this is obviously wrong. She, she, yes, she was born in Harlem, studied architecture at Columbia University, was licensed in the state of New York in 1954, the first woman architect uh, of color uh, to be uh, licensed in New York State. And she worked for the firm of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill 
a large important firm uh, who designed many, many uh, buildings that, that really expressed the principles of modernism. And she worked with various firms. Uh, in 1960, she joined the firm of Victor Gruen, a famous architect, and soon became a vice president of the firm and was pretty well responsible for the design of the US Embassy in Tokyo, uh, which you see here. Uh, then I'll mention Laurie Allison Wilson. And here she's shown in a con community discussion very close to where Susan and I used to live in the Central District uh, about the Africa Town Plaza. This is the, oh, what's it called? The Midtown Center, a new building at the intersection of Un Union and 23rd uh, with uh, significant murals on the exterior. And then this is the part of it uh, that belongs to an organization called Africa Town, in which she tried to give it uh, some character uh, harking back to Africa. You know, she, she, she looked at traditional, she actually traveled to Africa and looked at traditional Ac African designs, which gave her the idea of these curves. Uh, it's not quite finished, and this is a terrible photograph I took, uh, not quite catching the top of it, but you can see that there's some originality here uh, and uh, a departure from the standard apartment building that goes on and on in the same way all over the place. Well, now I'm going to get to my main subject for today, uh, Louis Kahn. Now, when I was at first a student of architecture, there were three architects who were virtually the gods that we worshipped. The first was Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, you see one of his prairie houses here, and an example in the plan of what was described as exploding the box. You know, if a typical house was a box, that was something to be left behind uh, with uh, the kind of plan that Wright uh, exploited in his prairie houses, of which this is a wonderful example, the Ward Willets House in Highland Park. And then there was Le Corbusier, whose landmark building was the Villa Savoie in Poissy, uh, near Paris. Paris. And uh, he again uh, was uh, to be worshipped. And he had a tremendous influence on Louis Kahn, uh, though uh, not particularly directly from this building. And the third one was Mies van der Rohe, who became famous for his design uh, at an exhibition in Barcelona in 1929. Uh, this is not actually taken in 1929. The building was removed, and it's been uh, re-envisioned here. It's been constructed as, as a replica, uh, and you can see it in Barcelona, where I took this picture. But then to that list, I and my friends added Alva Alto, the Finnish architect, who I have to say, I think is the greatest architect of the 20th century, because he had a sort of human, he gave buildings above all a human quality. Uh, this is a large, tall, modernist building early in his career, a TB sanatorium in Finland, but he designed many beautiful, subtle buildings using a lot of brick and timber and so on. But then I remember at some point uh, while I was a student, people started muttering about Louis Kahn, and uh, we, had, we had to find out about Louis Kahn. 
And he is my subject today. And this is the most unusual building, uh, which I'll go into more detail on before. Well, Louis Kahn, born in 1901 in Estonia, emigrated with his family, uh, who were Jews, who were ex escaping danger uh, to the United States. And they lived in poverty in Philadelphia. Somehow, Louis had learned to play the piano. And he used to help the family out by playing in the evenings uh, in a bar in Philadelphia when he was still a teenager. And he probably saved the lives of his family <laughs> by playing music. And I don't know whether he carried this on later through his career, uh, but uh, it was certainly important then. He studied. Uh, he got a scholarship to study at the Philadelphia Academy of Art. Uh, and the architecture program was uh, run by a man named Paul Kret, uh, who had been educated at the Beaux-Arts and really understood the principles of Beaux-Arts architecture. But what he really taught Kahn was not to do with style the revival of classical styles of the past, but various principles. And one of his principles, that if you were designing something, designing a building, it had to begin with a central idea. And I hope that you will see this happening in Kahn's work. And he believed uh, so much modern architecture was almost transparent or, or open uh, to, to, to the outside. And he, f he felt that it lacked the element of mass. Uh, and uh, classical buildings had a monumentality. And that seemed to have disappeared in modern architecture. And Kahn wanted to recover that in a subtle way. Kahn was in architectural practice uh, for quite a long time, uh, working for firms and then on his own, uh, building uh, low-cost housing uh, for the public good, and uh, was not particularly original in, the, in, in this work. But then he went to Rome and joined the medical the sorry american academy in rome uh, where he felt that a new world of architecture was opening to him and he traveled uh, extensively uh, in uh, europe uh, one of his autobiographical statements is a city is a place where a young boy would discover what he wanted to do with his life. And that city for him was Philadelphia. And I'm sure he saw the seamy side of Philadelphia, as well as these grand monuments, Independence Hall uh, and the City Hall. And uh, I've forgotten what that, the, Pe the Pennsylvania Academy. So he, Philadelphia uh, had an effect on him. Uh, this is some of his low-cost housing uh, from the time of the Depression and after. And then he set off on his travels. Uh, and it, we can just see him coming to life in these pictures that he drew. Uh, St. Mark's Venice, uh, the Piazza del Palio uh, in Siena. Architecture was something vigorous, alive. Uh, and even if he built it in black and white, uh, it was in some way co colorful. Having been to Greece uh, and seen the buildings of the Parthenon uh, and other places, he would frequently ask himself while he was at his drawing board, how am I doing Greek architecture? 
and Greek architecture would doubtless reply, how am I doing Gothic architecture? How am I doing Le Corbusier? Now, this is a later building of Le Corbusier. You saw the Villa Savoie raced up on stilts. And this is his amazing church at Ronchamp in eastern uh, France. How am I doing Le Corbusier? And that helped him on his way. He did a lot of sketches illustrating his principles uh, such as that architecture is at the intersection between silence and light, which you can understand from the drawings he did, which are full of meaning. meaning. Uh, this is too small for me to read, uh, but I will quote a little bit. Um, Archi architecture comes from the making of a room, and a, a, a street is a s the, the, the plan. Do you want me to read that yes. one? Yes. A street, are you reading the upper right one? Yes. A street is a room, a community room by agreement. Its character from intersections to intersection changes and may be regarded as a number of rooms. He beautiful. He had a lot of uh, theories uh, that he would recite to his students who, when he was teaching at, in the University of Philadelphia, uh, the students would sit at his feet and hang on his every word. I once went on a, to a lecture of his uh, on the campus at MIT. It was in a huge auditorium. I arrived late and was just outside the door, which was crowded with people. And this very small man was in the far distance. And you could have heard a pin drop in the, word, in the room. His, everyone was hanging on every word uh, that he said. Well, one of his first major commissions uh, after he formed his own practice in 1951 was the Yale Art Gallery. I think you can see from the pictures uh, that he's working with uh, a modernist vocabulary. Uh, but there's something different about this building uh, from the work, say, of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, uh, that uh, he's aware uh, of mass uh, and enclosure. Uh, those columns. Uh, in the facade on the right and some of the walls that you see on the left uh, give this building a mass. Whereas Skidmore's and Merrill, the Seagram building in New York, which I'm sure you've all passed by and looked at, uh, has a kind of s smoothness about the outer surface. Uh, it's all flat, nothing projects from it. Uh, it's a structure, it's deep inside the building, uh, and it lacks uh, the, the, the feeling of, of mass uh, that uh, Kahn wanted to produce. Oh, that's not my, no, the, the, of course that's Miss van der Rohe. Yes, yes, absolutely right. Thank you. <laughs> And so here is one of the galleries uh, in the Yale uh, Art Gallery. And we can immediately see that the ceiling, instead of being hidden uh, behind a suspended ceiling like this, this one is Skidmore. This is Lever House by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Uh, the ceiling uh, is absolutely flat uh, and almost featureless. Uh, but in the Yale Art Gallery, uh, there is a powerful structure here between uh, these intersecting uh, beams. Uh, there, is, there are spaces for ducts and wires uh, to be put out of sight. And partitions can be attached to the 
uh, to the elements of the ceiling in various configurations. So there's a kind of uh, combination of monumentality uh, and flexibility. Very uh, different uh, from uh, uh, from from this kind of uh, interior which we've seen everywhere, and here's another view of the interior uh, of the Yale Art Gallery uh, with partitions arranged in a different manner. And a wonderful feature of that building uh, is, is the staircase, which is actually enclosed within a, a, a cylinder uh, of concrete. Uh, so this tri series of triangles in the cylinder uh, gives it a vibrant effect, uh, very uh, original, and as we look up, we see the intersection of circle and triangle. Quite some time later, uh, in 1969, he started work on the Center for British Art at Yale University, which I'm sure some of you have been to, uh, which has one of the largest collections of British art uh, outside the United Kingdom. Uh, the exterior is very simple. Uh, it, it is not all glass. Uh, much of it is uh, solid panels. Uh, but when we come into it, we find, oh, we've got a little more outside first. Uh, we find that we find ourselves in an atrium uh, with divided into with the roof divided into four li lights uh, that bring the light, or allows the light to reflect uh, off uh, sloping surfaces uh, that give it, uh, I think, a subtle and vigorous effect. And up above here, you can see windows opening to the galleries. I had a terrible time trying to put two pictures together that didn't want to go together. Uh, but we, we can see how we have skylights uh, bringing light in, again reflecting off a diagonal surface. We look out over the atrium uh, to similar openings on two other sides, and then uh, the painting uh, on plain walls. It's a very, it's a very unusual uh, gallery. I, I quite uh, well remember going there uh, and uh, seeing the way uh, that the spaces and the art uh, are arranged uh, with subtlety. Well, now we come to the Richards Medical Center uh, in Philadelphia. It's, uh, it's uh, I should have said Medical Research Center. And Kahn developed a central idea uh, that the scientists who work there work on their own little piece of uh, imagination and science uh, in a small small space of their own, but they need a lot of services. Uh, since this is medical research, uh, animals were involved, unfortunately. And uh, so there were animal rooms. There were people who looked after the animals, uh, who provided all kinds of uh, services, uh, and they had to store all kinds of equipment. So that's a central area. Uh, but the scientists need to be in their individual uh, places, which, uh, does this, is this working? I think this isn't working today. Oh, it is, yeah. So here uh, are 
some small laboratories, and then this is the central area. And he talked in terms of served spaces and servant spaces, and if it differentiates them. But then another element was that because of the nature of the work, they needed a tremendous amount of ventilation. I hate to think what's going on in there, but they needed fresh air coming in, and they needed to exhaust stale air. And instead of, Khan himself said, I hate pipes and ducts. Uh, so he was, if he, if he was going to have ducts, he was going to make them heroic. And here you see them on the outside of the building. Uh, some of them are staircases, uh, some of them are ducts. Uh, and uh, then in the center, uh, the service area, including elevators. Uh, and I, this is it's all diag it's shown in this diagram. Uh, one and one and one are, sta are, are stair towers. And then two are service towers, which um, are expressed in a slightly different way. Uh, and then the air intakes uh, down here. <laughs> but he, as I said, made these uh, exhaust towers that t take out the stale air or the staircases uh, into uh, uh, evocative elements. And of course, I didn't have to be told this to see that it looks like San Gimignano. There's, there must be a, a, an inspiration from San Gimignano there, uh, a place uh, where lots of little cells of individual dwellings uh, and then the towers in which feuding families uh, defended themselves from each other uh, express in an extraordinary way. And, and this uh, is what Khan did with it. The, he was at this time working with an engineer named Commandant uh, who did mention to his friends at one time that Khan didn't have the least understanding of structure. Uh, but he became fascinated with structure as something that can be expressed in the architecture and involved uh, precast concrete elements which could be delivered uh, to the site and put together in a way like a tinker toy. Something that Khan did not consider enough uh, was the s excessive sunlight. And when I visited this place, I remember a lot of the windows were covered with aluminum foil, which obviously uh, speaks of a failure by the architect. Well, Khan had the opportunity to, uh, to design another complex for scientists doing research. This is the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. And if you are ever passing through Southern California on the coast, don't fail to go and see it. It is a staggering building. This is a central courtyard. Originally, he intended to have trees in it, uh, but I think it was the Mexican architect Barragan who said, no, you should leave it completely empty and have a place with trees uh, out outside the complex where the workers can uh, eat their lunches at tables and chairs under the uh, under the branches. It's, uh, this is really a staggering space. Uh, I don't quite understand the texture on this plan uh, in the center of the courtyard because th that is uh, an empty space. Maybe this was uh, an earlier plan, but what he what he did was he had two blocks uh, of offices, 
uh, or, or laboratories. Um, they were on either side of the central courtyard and they were separated uh, between floors where ducts and pipes could go anywhere they wanted out of sight. There's Helen having another go at I hate ducts and pipes. And um, so there were uh, level areas uh, and then a great deal of space for, for all, of, all of that. Uh, and then the, the little uh, work areas are here. So this is the servant space in the center, all kinds of minions um, doing all kinds of difficult things uh, for, for everybody. But then the individual scientists have their own spaces. So back to the central courtyard in the middle with that stream of water running down the middle, uh, coming from bubbling up in the foreground and coming down at the end in, and he must have made sure that the, that marble surface was absolutely smooth to get that the, 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 how do I describe the way the water comes down? Uh, it's, al it's almost like uh, as, as if it's a sheet of ice or something like that. <laughs> so the, the we have that huge empty courtyard and then we could go and look at the water coming, uh, coming out here. And it is a miraculous space. And then the offices are on either side and they are all turned towards uh, the view of the ocean and the sky uh, on the other side. And each one has uh, a little balcony as well. I, I wish I had a scientist who'd worked there tell me about it, uh, but I don't, I, I had a friend who was his on-site architect in, uh, in, in La Jolla who supervised the construction. And Khan was terribly concerned about the concrete. He had concrete companies make all kinds of sample batches uh, with different aggregates, different gravel uh, and sand, uh, you know, sand from different places uh, is not all the same. It, it changes color. Uh, and he described uh, how uh, he had different companies, different suppliers, pour slabs of concrete uh, vertically and horizontally, which they could examine and choose from. And when, when you go there, uh, you will see uh, the beautiful care taken with the concrete. Another of his work, and maybe to me his grace, greatest, I lived in Dallas for a while, and so I used to often go to Fort Worth to exhibitions at the Kimball Art Museum. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful art museums I know there's a certain uh, grace about it and uh, surprises. A series of tunnels with half cylindrical roofs, a courtyard, trees, and so on. It is approached on one side past a courtyard with beautifully mown grass in it, and the sculpture of what well, Susan's about to tell me, my mind is failing, Nogu Noguchi. Uh, I'm sure I could have photographed this better, but there's something stunning about this single stone attacked from various sides, 
standing there in this huge open space. And then we come to the front of the museum uh, where a kind of portico, it's an equivalent to the cl classical portico that might uh, be at the entrance to museums. And then water pouring from a shallow pool over an edge into another shallow pool. We could enter that that water is going pouring over there and there's more on the other side. Um, we could walk over this uh, area of gravel and I, rem I remember uh, coming along, uh, walking on the grass uh, from another art museum by Philip Johnson to to this place and then deciding to walk through this crunchy gravel and you 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 sort of aware of what's happening underfoot. Oh, I have this habit. Sorry about that. And then another area of the portico is a place where you can sit and medicate meditate before you enter. You look up at a wall uh, built of travertine, which is a stone uh, to be found in Rome. Much of Rome is built of travertine. It's kind of porous. It's a little bit like Swiss cheese uh, that, um, uh, th th that has uh, sort of openings in it. And shadows enliven the space. He's very conscious of how shadows will be cast as he works on his drawing board. And then on the interior, daylight enters uh, through a complex roofing uh, ceiling system uh, where it partly uh, is reflected off surfaces, partly uh, penetrates through, uh, uh, through obscured glass. And the galleries, to my mind, have a beautiful simplicity and the quality of life, light, is definitely uh, satisfying. <coughs> and then here's this courtyard. You can't see the sculpture hovering there very well. Uh, not a very good picture, uh, but there it is. And more galleries. Well then, in the 60s, he was commissioned to, to design a National Assembly building at Deng Dash Dhaka in ba Bangladesh. Well, some of you may have known that Le Corbusier uh, designed a similar a building for a similar purpose. Uh, this was actually in the capital of the Punjab, but it's the High Court building, uh, which uh, is immensely sculptural. A great sort of separate roof structure hovers above it, uh, protecting, uh, pr protecting the building from some of the sunlight. And in front of it is a screen work uh, of concrete, uh, which again lets light through, uh, lets air through and, and light. And there's another view of Le Corbusier's building. And so while he was working on it, Kahn was saying, how am I doing, Le Corbusier? And uh, this is his building in Dhaka, uh, which also, uh, he goes even further, the pool, I think, virtually surrounds the building. And as is evident in the view, view from above, maybe this is a view of a model, uh, the, there is a powerful geometry uh, organizing uh, the building. He takes 
circles, rectangles, triangles, and plays with them uh, in a very deliberate manner. And we're aware of these forms as we move through the building. As in Chandigarh, Le Corbusier, heat being in a very hot place uh, is a very uh, important ele element. And uh, we, we have a sort of uh, open air but shaded. This, this, this is Khan in, in Dhaka. This is the building I have of his that I haven't seen. Um, and it made me think in a way of this uh, bazaar in Isfahan, uh, not very directly, uh, but if, if, if I'm forced to think of something, I can't avoid it. <laughs> I wish I'd seen this building too. Uh, it uh, is, is really amazing. A lot, a lot of extra construction material uh, here uh, to create these uh, spaces between the inside and the outside, transitional spaces between the inside uh, and the outside. And then uh, this is the assembly hall in the middle, uh, lit in an extraordinary manner. Anyone been there? I've, I've been to India, but not Bangladesh. So uh, that is what I can show you on Louis Kahn. I would love to have some discussion or any questions. But before that, I want to just mention something else. Some of you may know uh, one of the caregivers here whose name is Emmanuel. Anyone know Emmanuel? He's a very, very fine man. And his daughter studied architecture uh, where I taught it at WSU, but long afterwards. And she graduated a few years ago and has been working at a firm in Seattle. And she was just invited back, and Emmanuel went with her uh, to receive a prize. There were about 15 students who were given prizes. He was planning to give me pictures of the event uh, and also some explanation of what was going on. It's unusual to, to get a prize a couple of years after you graduate uh, with a, a group of other people. And she's also been offered a scholarship for graduate school. And although she's working at the moment, uh, she plans to go back to graduate school in uh, Jude. And so, uh, I've talked about some architects of the past, some famous architects of the past. I think Grace, I don't remember the surname, uh, Emmanuel's daughter Grace will be a great architect of the future, and I'm very happy for him and their family. Well, any comments on Khan or questions? I'm sure Grant has some things to say that I forgot to mention. Well, several things, Henry. Thank you for the talk and for your enthusiasm for Khan, and also for Alto. I feel, too, that Alto was one of the really fine figures of the century. <coughs> your comment about his gentleness uh, of, of uh, touch is really appropriate. Uh, he had a, a, a soft, uh, gentleness is a good word, uh, that isn't really characteristic of the other great household names, and I like his work very much indeed. <coughs> Khan had uh, some failures uh, along the way. The Richards building didn't serve very well as a research building, but I remember when it first came out, it was 1961, it was in all the journals, and it was exciting to us because 
he kind of took the idea of architecture apart and dealt with the parts and put the parts together in a fresh and powerful way. It always seemed timeless to me. It could have been built in Rome or, or in some future time. I was very enthusiastic about the building, as were many at the time. It was a real game changer. It didn't work well as a research building, but it certainly worked as an exciting way of thinking about architecture. I think the, the attached uh, pieces that served as ducks and things owed a good bit to Wright's Unity Temple, which is very much the same idea of 1904. Um, that's, a, that's a good, a very good e example, yes. Yeah. Uh, Unity Temple in Oak Park uh, outside Chicago. I'm going to be giving a talk in a few weeks about Wright, and, and we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, I do think Kahn had some failures. His dormitory at Bryn Mawr is more a prison than a dorm. Uh, <laughs> it's not a happy building. And I remember one of his talks in which he came out on the stage and stood for quite a while and looked around and finally said, light, light is. And he left the stage. And I thought, well, maybe that's inspiring, but um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, near the end of his life, she asks. I'm not sure of the date. Um, yes, it would certainly have been quite near. That's right. It had been 1970 or thereabouts. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'd have to add, I think that Museum of British Art at Yale is a wonderful building. I like it so much. Thank you. Well, are there any questions or other comments? I arrived a little late, so I'm not sure if you mentioned his private life. Uh, no, I didn't. Um, I was withholding that, but uh, let's move on to it. <laughs> There's a, I think you would know about the CD on his, uh, his life, which is called My Architect. That was done by his one son from the three marriages that he had. Oh, right. Simultaneously, he was married to three women at the same time. And when he was found dead in the uh, restroom at the... Uh, LaGuardia or one of the New York airports. In his passport, his name and all the details were scratched out. <laughs> yeah, he was a very unusual well, man. Well, I, I knew An Ting, who was uh, quite an early um, uh, colleague in his office. I, I don't know if she was a partner, but she, she, was, a, she was a very good designer. And uh, it's thought to have had quite a bit of a success uh, of influence on him. I happened to go to China in a group with a group of architects, uh, one of whom was An Ting, and another one who I'm sure Grant knows, James Marston Fitch. Uh, th so we, we were in great company. I, I enjoyed An Ting's company a great deal on that trip. Was she one of the three wives? Or she was one of the three wives, yes. <laughs> he also designed something that I thought was a rather fascinating idea, too. Didn't he design the uh, barge with a symphony on it that it could go and visit larger cities and pull up to a dock so that more people could have the opportunity to see a, a first-class musical without having to pay and go into the center of the city to see it, which <laughs> I thought was kind of a great idea. <laughs> yes. it, didn't, it didn't sail, though, apparently, <laughs> very much. But there is barge music in New York, not well, maybe Gordon. designed by Kahn. Oh, Gordon needs a mic. I know a little bit about the research at the Salk Institute, ah. which was designed for cancer research particularly. And one of the distinguished scientists came with Sir Francis Crick, uh, the co-discoverer of the, the structure of DNA. Um, and he was wanting then to apply his f physical physicist knowledge and insights into the study of, of cancer. And his work was, of course, entirely theoretical. Um, and um, unfortunately, we remember Francis Crick for 
DNA. Yeah, we know there was a woman involved, right? <laughs> there was a play about her. Your presentation has effect given me a re revisitation of my years studying architecture under Vincent Scully at Yale. Uh -huh. He had the same five, big five you have, including Alvar Alto. And uh, when, the, when his art, the first art gallery went in in the 50s, I just fell in love with the wall that's on, uh, that's on I think it's Chapel Street. It's the length of that brick wall was so gorgeous. And the, the second building, the British art, didn't come until after I graduated. But I, I did go back with my, with my wife to see it. And it, I agree, it's totally stunning. <laughs> Thanks so much for an incredible review of my youth. <laughs> well, what, 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 yeah. what, and of what course, Vincent you? Scully, if you haven't heard of him. Maybe you've all heard of Vincent Scully. I don't know. He was a sensational architectural historian that had massive audiences and strutted around the stage, right, Henry? When, when he was on the stage and there were slides up behind, there were images projected behind him, he would conduct them like the conductor of an orchestra. <laughs> Yeah. He got a standing ovation from the classes in his in his classes after every lecture. Uh, unbelievable. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. 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 Grant. Scully did a book that's very exciting to me before my graduate years, uh, The Earth, the Temple, and the Gods about Greek architecture. Yes. And uh, it was largely wrong uh, <laughs> beyond any question. He argued that the uh, Parthenon was a trophy to the Battle of Salamis because it faced the island. But the Parthenon was built on earlier foundations long before the battle, and Greek Temples tend to face east and west, and if you're facing east and west on the Acropolis, uh, Salamis is a big island out there to the west. It was full of that kind of problem, and it was criticized for that, but it was an exciting book because it put forth ideas that were worth pondering. I think it was a, a flawed but wonderful book, and uh, I, I value it for, for that excitement. Great. You, you forgive him his mistakes. <laughs> Who else? Anybody Does, else? Uh, do, do he Over has here. some more to say? Yes. Uh, by the time I came along, he realized that was a terrible mistake, and he was quite open about it publicly that he screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? This is your last chance. This is the last lecture. But I, I understand that uh, that Grant is going to give some oh, more lectures on. Are you going to give more than one? I'm giving a talk on Frank Lloyd Wright. Great. Um, on when is it? Um, April fifth. April fifth. We need Frank Lloyd Wright in this story. Yeah, Wright was a very promising architect. <laughs> 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 he had an interesting private life too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, I, I just wanted to mention that the, what's that? Somebody's phone? Uh, the, the black architects, is that in here? Well, just go on. Okay, that, that, that Henry talked about at the beginning uh, are very interesting, and there was a show at the Museum of History and Industry devoted to black architects in the US, which is how we got started with that theme, and uh, the, Norma Sklerik was referred to as the Rosa Parks of architecture because she was such a phenomenal leading figure in pioneering as a black woman. And she had a lot of trouble at the beginning of her career getting a job, and oh, et cetera. She, she said that she visited, she applied to 19 firms uh, for a place in their office and were turned down by all of them. Yeah. And then very the 20th, challenging. The 20th was more of a sort of public office. It was. Uh, a, uh, I don't know exactly, but it, it was the it, uh, it was a Department of Public Works in New York City. Right. But then she went on to a great career with uh, all sorts of other firms, and then Benjamin McAdoo, what he did for AID was low cost housing. He had a prefab way of building small houses, and he went to Haiti, I think, 
does that sound right? Uh, to for the AID to build these prefab houses. So it's very I think interesting. It was Jamaica. Was it Jamaica? I, I'm not sure what country, but he had quite a invention with this. And quite a lot of them were built in the United States. Over. Okay. Yeah. So, um. Anyway, I'm just adding that. Anybody else? Any other comments? How many wives did they all have? <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Thank you for coming. <laughs>